ground warfare is about defending or capturing land. The terrain itself plays a central role. Both in attack and defense, a commander must use the landscape to his advantage, a principle that goes right back to ancient warfare. The legions of Rome operated in all kinds of terrain, and their engineers were some of the most successful in military history. It is the year 122 AD. On what is today the border between England and Scotland, the Roman Emperor Hadrian builds a wall to defend his empire's northern frontier. A construction with all the hallmarks of Roman engineering. It takes advantage of a natural rocky outcrop in the landscape. It's 118 kilometers long and reinforced with fortresses. A massive building project, but Hadrian has clear military objectives. If you have a long frontier and you don't have adequate number of people who can be deployed, then you build a wall and that keeps the enemy out and it can be guarded at much less cost. Just as the Great Wall of China begun more than 700 years earlier, Hadrian's Wall sends a powerful message to enemies, one that rams home the might of Imperial Rome. But engineering in warfare is as much about offensive measures as defensive walls. The Romans, like generations of soldiers that followed them, are expert at using the pick and shovel in attacking operations. If you have a wall, there's only three ways to get past it. You go over it, you go under it, or you go through it. And there's a science that will develop to do that. The Roman method of defeating defensive walls is famously seen in action at Masada in Israel. The capture of this fortress in the year 73 AD reveals the way Roman engineers use industry, ingenuity, and careful planning to clinch victory. Masada has been chosen by Jewish rebels for their stand against the Romans because of its inaccessible location. Masada is an excellent example of an ancient fortification. In other words, taking a naturally very strong natural feature, this enormous mountain really behind me, and then fortifying it. A great piece of defendable terrain, giving a huge height advantage to the rebels. But Roman engineers examine the landscape, searching for weaknesses in the rebels' position, and devise a plan to defeat them. They begin by building eight fortified camps, positioned to surround Masada. Each one a base from which to launch siege operations. Here, facing the southern end of Masada, one camp is deliberately built upon a cliff top. This is actually the only place that you can see what's going on on top of Masada. It performs an important surveillance role. All these camps are part of a wider offensive strategy that involves a five kilometer long encircling wall. The circumvallation. It measures nearly two meters wide and three meters high all the way round. And its purpose is clear. It stops anybody going in, stops anybody going out, and to all the defenders on the top, it is a stone noose has been put round them and there is no escape. It was sort of a statement. We built, we, we surrounded you, you're doomed. This massive construction effort might intimidate the rebels, but it can't defeat them. For that, the Romans need something far more difficult to engineer. The only way that the Romans could really get to grips with the defenders at Masada was by 
constructing an enormous assault ramp. Before building their assault ramp, they first need to choose a suitable location. They identify the one chink in Masada's armor, a natural spur of land on the western side of the fortress that the Romans reckon can be the basis of their ramp. Even so, they still have to construct a ramp more than 200 meters in length. Its gradient has to be shallow enough to enable an armored siege tower to be dragged up to the fortress walls. Once at the top, a powerful battering ram housed inside the tower will smash through the walls. Roman artillery will continually rake the tops of the walls with stone shot to protect the ramp construction teams. But the chief problem is engineering a ramp with the stability to support the siege tower. Physical clues to how the Romans achieve this can be found today. Now, these bits of timber here have been here for nearly 2,000 years. They were laid by Roman legionaries when they were building this immense ramp behind us. We think they're some form of reinforcing, rather like we have steel rods in concrete today to hold that together. So these timbers were driven in on horizontal layers to try and keep the ramp in one compact mass. Though it's difficult to determine exactly how this was done, it's possible they dug terraces into the sides of the natural spur. With these stable foundations in place, prefabricated wooden boxes supported by reinforcing timbers and filled with rubble, can be stacked up. Now, the ramp is strong enough to bear the weight of the siege tower. Roman engineering neutralizes Masada's height advantage, and the attack on the walls also exploits a flaw in the design of this mountain fortress. The towers at Masada do not project out beyond the wall line. This does not allow for any flanking fire. It reduces their defensive capability quite substantially. So what we have at Masada is essentially a passive defensive system. Defenses that cannot withstand this kind of planned attack. From 50 BC to 150 AD, Roman engineering, supported by artillery, played an important role in the empire's expansion. Many centuries will pass before defenses come up with an effective counter to the systematic siege operation. The Middle East in the year 1188. Saladin, the great Muslim leader, has inflicted a crushing defeat on the Crusaders at the Battle of Hattin. But to take control of the Holy Lands, Saladin needs next to drive them from castles such as Crac de Chevalier in today's Syria. These castles allow the Crusaders to maintain a foothold in the region. One thing that we have to remember is the number of the Crusaders in the greater Syria region was minuscule, and they were holding much larger land that they could defend. Like Hadrian's Wall for the Romans, castles such as Crac compensate for this lack of manpower. Their design had evolved during the Crusades of the 11th and 12th centuries. We have 150 years of struggle between the two sides, attack and counterattack, and they are learning from each other. This fusion of ideas means that engineers work out the best ways to fortify their castles. The result is a new kind of defensive engineering, far superior to the passive system at Masada. What happened in the second half of the 12th century and the first half of the 13th century is that these castles became much more massive. The whole structure tended to become taller, bigger, 
broader. Every aspect of crack has a specific purpose based on a concept called defense in depth. The first line of defense relies on towers designed to be strong enough to mount heavy trebuchets on top. This new kind of counterweight artillery can strike an attacking force more than 350 meters away. More than this, these towers deliberately project outwards, enabling lines of fire to both the front and flanks. The castle engineers want to build in more than a single defensive system. Here, one of the ways they do this is through concentric walls. Concentric walls on a castle mean an outer defense and an inner defense. And you can, in fact, have an outer, a middle, and an inner. You can take this thing quite a long way. It gives you defense in depth. Defense in depth also relied on defense in height. One of the vital features of concentric design is that your inner fortifications, your inner line of wall, has to be higher than your outer, so that if the enemy does take the outer wall, they cannot use it as a fortification for themselves. They are completely overlooked by archers and defenders on the inner wall. But if the worst happens and the entrance is breached, this type of castle had fallback lines of defense. At crack, the passageway into the castle is engineered to provide a series of killing zones. With the aid of a paintball gun, David Nicole will show how. The man in the crash helmet represents an attacking soldier who's broken into the castle. He will be Nicole's target. Advancing up the passageway, the attacker is going to be exposed through openings known as murder holes. It's directly above the main entrance passageway which runs beneath us from the main gate to the interior of the castle. Right. If the defenders fail to get the attacker during the first opportunity to shoot, they'll have plenty of others. If I haven't stopped them then, I have one last chance. These murder holes demonstrate how multiple defensive positions are the core of these castle's designs. And they prove themselves in battle. In 1188, the Crusaders at Crack successfully beat off the attack from Saladin. Defense in depth will be an important part of military engineering right up until the present day. In the fast-moving battles of modern war, there is often no time for the building of fortifications. Yet the defensive principles of Crusader castles still apply. This is Iraq in 2004, the fight for Fallujah. US Marines are coming under heavy fire from Iraqi insurgents. Both sides improvise as the battle develops. What's gonna happen? M16s, 240. We're gonna pop up. We're gonna do five seconds of suppression. Right, Ready, set, go, hose up. In a constantly shifting battlefield, rooftop brick walls offer both defensive protection and a height advantage to these soldiers. From up here, they can shoot down onto the insurgents' position. But Fallujah's buildings give advantages to both sides. 
every single street is effectively its own fortress dominated by its own miniature castles of rubble or whatever. So from a command and control point of view, it makes it incredibly difficult. Command and control is key to success in battle. And the course of military history has shown that it's affected by many factors. Terrain is one. The impact of innovations in weaponry is another. In the 14th century, the advent of gunpowder artillery would transform the way battles were fought. Military engineers had to adapt to this powerful new threat. 1480, southeastern Europe, the island of Rhodes, today part of Greece. An army of Ottoman Turks bombards the fortress of Rhodes with the most powerful gunpowder artillery the world had ever seen. Medieval walls are not constructed to withstand this kind of attack. A small force of Christian Hospitaller knights hold firm against the Muslim onslaught. After a brutal siege lasting two months, the Ottomans withdraw. The Hospitallers prevail, but only just. And their leader, Pierre d'Aubusson, knows the Ottomans will be back. Dobusson is an early witness to what heavy artillery can do to medieval stone walls. He realizes that roads' defenses need to be re-engineered. Pretty much the next morning, Pierre Dobusson gets up and says, whoops, we didn't, we didn't win because our walls were invulnerable. And so he starts to rebuild them. They rethink the whole principles of fortification. No longer do they feel that tall, thin walls will be effective against gunpowder weapons. Walls are increased from 2.5 meters to 8 meters width. And a new defensive feature appears called a bastion. It's a massive fortification that projects out from the main wall enabling more lines of fire against attackers. Several bastions are built on roads, each one a kind of giant gun turret, bristling with cannon. The guns have become so big and so powerful, 18, 20 tons, 12, 14 feet, that the hospitalers had to build their own firing platforms, these enormous platforms, just to counter the recoil of them. These gun platforms are just one example of how they plan to deal with the next Ottoman attack. It's kind of odd to walk around the walls of Rhodes and you don't see anything that is the same as another feature. It's almost as if they're experimenting with everything that anybody thinks of that might preserve the city from the guns of the Ottoman Turks. This curious construction, for instance, is called a caponnier. It's a thin gun gallery that sticks out right at the sharpest angle of the walls. This could be filled with smaller guns and could be fired down both sides of the moat to cover any attacks made on it or on the walls next to it. And this freestanding wall, called an outwork, is one of a number created by Dobusson during his widening of the moat to provide additional defensive barriers. Instead of just digging 50 meters of moat, he leaves this outer work in the middle of the moat. Now the attackers have to go down one side of the moat, defeat the outer work, go down the other side of the moat, and now they get to attack the walls. In June 1522, the Ottomans are back. Tens of thousands of soldiers, led by their Sultan, Suleiman the Magnificent, lay siege to the fortress. Facing them, a hospitaller force of barely 6,000. I don't think that anything like the 1522 siege had been seen in warfare ever before. 
wave after wave of Ottoman assaults break upon the newly strengthened walls of Rhodes. The Knights Hospitaller would kill a 1,000, and they'd look up, and there'd still be 20,000, because another 1,000 had arrived from Turkey. There's one eyewitness, Jacques de Bourbon, and he talks about the blood being so thick on the ground, from so many Ottomans being killed, that you can't see actual dirt. It's just blood. Though the Ottomans lose thousands trying to crack Rhodes' new defenses, their attacks keep coming. After six months of siege, the Hospitallers get to a point where their own losses force them to surrender. In the end, Suleiman the Magnificent, the one who wins, this young sultan, admits to the Hospitallers that he had lost 103,000 men to take Rhodes, and that he'd gladly lose 103,000 more. Despite the Hospitallers' defeat, the strength of Rhodes' defensive engineering innovations had been vividly demonstrated. Pretty soon, all throughout Europe and all throughout the Middle East, people are building forts just like the Hospitallers had built in Rhodes. Rhodes is part of an explosion of ideas on how to combat gunpowder artillery. In Italy, Engineers build star-shaped fortresses with triangular bastions designed to give defensive crossfire. And they experiment with earth as a backing to masonry walls. One section of this simple brick wall has been backed with earth, more than tripling its width. The remainder has no reinforcement. It's going to be shot at with this reproduction cannon from point-blank range. The results are easy to see. After several shots, the unreinforced wall is near collapse. Clean through. Now, the cannon will be trained on the earth-backed section of brick wall. Earth backing makes a big difference. It's amazing the difference between the, the stone here, where there's no earth behind it, and here, where the addition of earth has acted as a shock absorber. Here, we have no penetration whatsoever. The wall is solid. Experiments like these show that wide walls of brick and earth are the way forward. Defensive engineering will soon reach a new level of sophistication. 1698, Eastern France. Construction is underway on a fortress that represents the zenith of defensive design, Neuf Brissac. Today, Neuf Brissac is a quiet little town, close to the border with Germany. Its defenses were designed by a brilliant French military engineer, Sébastien Vauban, a nobleman schooled in the art of fortification. Everybody learned the rudiments of fortification. They learned it because the nobility was uh, the, still the warrior class, and fighting in this time had to do with knowing the techniques of fortification. Vauban's talents, though, set him apart. His rise came at a time when France was at war with virtually every European state on its borders. And he built or upgraded some 160 fortresses. At the core of his defensive engineering is the Italian star fortress design. But Neuf Brissac shows how Vauban shapes the landscape to the defender's advantage. Right now, I'm walking just outside Neuf Brissac. What's really amazing about it is that from where you are right now, you can't even see all the ditches. There's countryside all around, but it just looks like we're walking on a slightly hilly terrain, when in fact, we're only 20 meters away from all the fortification ditches they're designed to be hidden from view, and high ground has been cleverly created. 
the ground is gently sloping upwards. It was calculated very carefully by Vauban so that the height advantage would still belong to the people inside the fortifications. Suddenly, here you are, and you have the counter scarp, you have the ditch, you have this vast protection of the fort. At the time, all you would have seen from this point of view was earth and the barrels of guns and cannons pointed at you from soldiers positioned on the ramparts. To threaten the main fortress walls, an attack first has to get past these outworks. What were experiments at Rhodes nearly 200 years earlier have now become a standard fortification technique. And guns inside the bastions defend the ground immediately in front of the main wall. What that means is that one bastion covers the other one. They each shoot crisscross style so that there's no cover along the wall. From inside a bastion, it's possible to see what these structures give the defenders. Any attackers down here in the ditch can be caught in a killing zone. Though Nerf Prisac is never tested in battle, many fortresses built on Vauban's model are. And not just in France. Fort McHenry at the mouth of Baltimore's harbor. In 1814, its American garrison successfully withstand a massive British naval bombardment, inspiring the poem, The Star-Spangled Banner. Fort McHenry is very much indebted to the Vauban style and the French influence. In fact, Fort McHenry was built by three different French military engineers. McHenry, like Nerf Brissac, has a star shape with bastions at each point. Low, earth-backed walls and outworks. During the British bombardment, they fired over 1,800 heavy 13-inch, 200-pound exploding shells at Fort McHenry. So you can imagine those bombs raining down and exploding over the fort. But the, the design of the fort and its thick, heavy walls helped shelter the men. Despite the ferocity of the bombardment, the garrison holds out. Eventually, they drive the British ships away. McHenry's successful defense owes much to Vauban. Yet Vauban's engineering, like that of the Romans, is as much about attacking a fortress as defending it. These 17th century documents set out techniques a general should use in conducting a siege. Again, digging is vital. A series of zigzag and parallel trenches protect attackers so they can bring artillery close enough to smash through defensive walls. And, like his Roman predecessors, Vauban shows that engineering can give a general command and control in both attack and defense. In the centuries that follow, military engineering will evolve again as it adapts to far-reaching changes in weapons technology. July 1864, the American Civil War. The town of Petersburg, Virginia is besieged. The age of trench warfare has begun. Confederate General Robert E. Lee has built a 16-kilometer-long defensive line to guard Petersburg. Facing him are the forces of Union General Ulysses S. Grant. Both sides are dug in. The increased lethality of the battlefield because of rifled weapons caused first soldiers and then later their generals to alter the ground at every opportunity. 
dig that field fortification, get your people underground so that the attacker had to come at you from a position of disadvantage. High stone walls have disappeared. Defensive warfare relies now on digging down into the ground. As the attacker, Grant has to break through the Confederate trench lines. One of his officers, Henry Pleasance, a former mining engineer, comes up with a clever plan. He was indicative of a new kind of soldier that really represented the popularization of scientific and technical knowledge and were able to apply that during the war. Pleasance proposes a secret engineering operation. He will dig a tunnel under the Confederate line and blow it up from below. Pleasance needed to make sure that the end of the tunnel was in exactly the right place. If it had been too far in front of or behind the Confederate lines, the effect of the explosion would have been minimal. Like modern surveyors, he uses a theodolite to measure the angles between various points on the battlefield, enabling him to then calculate the exact length of tunnel that has to be dug. He determines it needs to be 156 meters long. And with that distance, there is the problem of how to ventilate the far end of the tunnel. As the miners continued to work, as they breathed out their carbon dioxide uh, without air coming in to the tunnel, they would have quickly suffocated. Pleasant's solution was quite magnificent in its elegance and simplicity. First, carbon dioxide will be removed by sinking a shaft into the tunnel near its entrance. At the bottom, a continuously burning fire will draw the stale air up and out. And to avoid drawing attention to the smoke, Pleasance would have his men burn decoy fires along their lines. Meanwhile, fresh air will be sucked into the miners at the tunnel face through a wooden ductwork. Here's our construction of the ductwork that the air went into where the soldiers were working. This modified aquarium tank shows how Pleasant's system works. This Pyrex II represents the ductwork that they built. The Union lines would be over here, uh, Confederate lines to the left. And this Pyrex II represents the vertical shaft that Pleasant's constructed. And this burner is the fire Pleasance builds. Ross then fills the mock-up tunnel with smoke to represent the stale air. Once the burner is lit, the smoky air is warmed and rises up and out of the funnel. The moving flaps show that fresh air is being drawn in, keeping the Union soldiers alive. After 34 days of work underground, the digging is complete. Union troops stand ready as the final preparations are made at the tunnel face. At the end of it, in kind of a T shape, they had two 30-foot galleries where they would store four tons of black gunpowder. A huge quantity of gunpowder placed right beneath the Confederate line. Early in the morning of July the 30th, 1864, the fuse is lit. There was this tremendous explosion, uh, almost like a, a geyser going off. Body parts, wagon wheels, cannons, huge pieces of dirt the size of a house began to rain down. The Confederate lines that had stood seconds before were now obliterated, and what was left was an enormous crater. 278 Confederates are killed in the explosion. But a poorly directed follow-up assault that sees Union troops going right into rather than round the crater ends in a failure to break through and a retreat back to their own line. Yet the massive crater made by the explosion and Henry Pleasant's tunnel shows how the engineer can pinpoint a problem and find a solution. Barely 50 years later, this kind of underground operation will be taken onto a whole new level.
Spring 1916, World War I, the Verdun battlefield in France. German and French armies are locked in a bitter struggle. Both sides dig tunnels under the strategically important hill of Vauquois. Simon Pepper, a historian of military architecture, has come to investigate. This is an entrance to one of the tunnels on the French side. Underground, they're still part of a railway used to transport excavated earth from the mine face. Below the hill of Vauquois, there is an absolute mass of tangled network of tunnels, each one trying to get under the enemy's tunnels so that they could destroy them or break into them and kill the miners. This map shows the French tunnel network on the south side of the hill, the German tunnels to the north, and the village of Vauquois in between. In total, more than 17 kilometers of tunnels are dug. On the French side, soldiers leave the tunnels at the end of a day's shift. But for the Germans, there is no respite. Their men lived in the tunnels for weeks at a time, lodging in little dugout chambers off the main galleries. Signs of the Germans' presence are everywhere. Here, carved into the wall, the symbol of an iron cross. All warfare is, is horrible, but the, the underground war of mining and countermining must be amongst the most horrible in most people's imagination where you're operating in the dark, in foul conditions, running with water, trying to work quietly so that you weren't overheard by the enemy. It's at risk either of being blown to eternity or suddenly find your workings invaded by fighters armed with clubs and knives for a grim fight in the dark. This underground warfare is made more deadly by the use of a new weapon. The big difference by the time we get to the First World War is that high explosive has become available. This early form of high explosive has 10 times the destructive power of gunpowder. At Vauquois, there are more than 500 separate underground explosions. The top of the hill is literally blown away. The French eventually prevail, but all that remains of the village are a few brick foundations. Underground warfare would be used sporadically in later 20th century conflicts in Korea and Vietnam. In Vietnam, for instance, the Viet Cong make very effective use of their Ku Chi tunnel system. They build an extraordinary 250 kilometers of tunnels that serve as bomb shelters, arm stores, and a launch pad for surprise attacks against American forces. In World War I, though, engineering defenses is as much about shaping the battlefield above ground as below it. The trenches dominating the Western Front have a new, highly effective barrier in front of them. Barbed wire. This late 19th century farming invention was quickly seen to have military potential. It gives a defender the advantage by hindering an attacker's advance or funneling him into killing zones. And because it's mostly empty space, it's difficult to destroy. You walk up to the barbed wire, and there's no way to get past. And there's really no way back, either. And the enemy machine guns, which you're trained on, you're going to cut you down. At the Battle of the Somme in 1916, British artillery tries to cut paths through the German barbed wire before their infantry attack. They use air-bursting shrapnel shells against the wire but it's tougher than they anticipate. This represents a shrapnel shell 
in as much as shrapnel shells were used to attack uh, barbed wire entanglements. Steel balls, backed by a plastic explosive charge, will mimic the airburst of the shrapnel shell. If you were to be bold enough to lie there, I can guarantee you're going to be seriously dead. But you're not a barbed wire entanglement, and the, the mechanics of it are very different. It explodes barely a metre above the wire. Well, as we can see, the wire is intact. There are six strands, and there were six strands before we fired it. The explosive has penetrated the wood, but done little damage to the barbed wire. And this is what the British infantry found to their cost when they attacked the German lines at the Somme. On the northern sectors of the battlefield, perhaps about two-thirds of the battlefield, the barbed wire was not cut. Barbed wire was perhaps the most crucial element in predicting the outcome of a battle. Barbed wire's toughness helps establish it as a vital defensive tool in World War I. And it has played an important part in many battles since. Its modern incarnation, razor wire, is still a common feature on today's battlefields. Yet barbed wire was not the only engineering innovation of World War I. For the defense of some strategically important towns in France, new kinds of fortresses are built. Fort Douaumont helped defend the town of Verdun, a vital point of the French army's line as it stood on an important crossing of the Meuse River. Douaumont's design is a response to the now increased power and range of artillery. Most of these fortifications are underground, and the tops of them are protected by earth to absorb the shock and the, and the concussion of artillery blasts. But earth is not the only layer of protection at Douaumont. The original fortress had been built in the 1870s. Just 30 years later, the French realize it's outdated. We're on the south face of Fort Dumont, and what we can see here is very clear evidence of the upgrade that took place um, shortly before the First World War. The light-colored stone is the original design for the fort. The grey material, the concrete here, is the massive thickening that took place in response to uh, the added power of artillery. Douaumont is part of a radical rethink of what a fortress should do. The fortress system at Verdun is not one fort, and it's not one gigantic set of walls that connect one another. What it is instead is a system of large forts and smaller forts, what the French called ouvrage, that are designed to protect one another and cover one another. A network of 19 fortresses defend Verdun. This system, as with the mutually supporting bastions of a Vauban fort, offers overlapping zones of defense. Each fort can neutralize an attack by using artillery to lay down a wall of defensive fire. The big gun here, the 150 millimeter, was capable of firing some miles and would defend the neighboring forts by um, sweeping the ground in front of them and sometimes even sweeping the tops of them. And Douaumont, in turn, can be supported by forts on either side of it. The loss of a fort did not necessarily mean that the entire system collapsed. You could still fight from the other forts. Like the concentric walls of a crusader castle, defense in depth is again deployed but now adapted to the age of modern warfare. Verdun's fortress system is soon tested in a momentous battle. At first, the Germans seem to be winning. They attack in February 1916, and by early March, Douaumont has been captured. In June, Fort Vaux falls as well but the other French forts do their job. 
But while two of the major forts fall, Douaumont is the largest of the forts by far, the system itself holds, and as a result, the Germans don't get into Verdun and they can't cross the Meuse River in force. Douaumont is recaptured by French forces in October, and they eventually win the Battle of Verdun. Success that influences their generals after the war as they try to fortify France against future attacks. After the war, the idea was to extend these fortifications along the border to protect the country against a new kind of uh, attack. And French leaders realized that a drop in the country's birth rate would put them at a major disadvantage should Germany attack again. The French in the 1930s had a major manpower problem. They could not compete with Germany in terms of mobilizable manpower of military age. Their solution is the Maginot Line. This Maginot line blazes into action. It has similarities with Verdun's defensive system. The theory behind the Maginot Line is to take some of those same principles, underground fortifications, interlocking systems, systems that mutually reinforce one another, to create a defensive line that would help France in a future war. French military planners thought command and control could be achieved with this method of defense. Today, hidden in the hills of eastern France, is some of the Maginot Line. Armored gun emplacements, tank traps, and man traps, all part of Hackenberg Fortress. It's a series of linked combat blocks. Here, at block five, each opening would have been occupied by an artillery piece. Much of what is exposed today was hidden back in the 1930s. Camouflaged observation turrets were just one feature of Hackenberg. By the standards of the time, the Maginot Line was really incredibly sophisticated. They were using all the technologies that could be used at that time. I mean, revolving turrets with a high rate of fire. An electrically powered gun turret has been restored. It houses cannon that would rise up, shoot several shots, then disappear from view. Underground, Hackenberg's extent is revealed. 10 kilometers of tunnels, served by their very own train. Designed to be self-sufficient if the electricity is cut, diesel engines can generate power for the combat blocks. Every part of the Maginot Line is made as strong as possible. The defensive is supreme, i.e. it's far better to sit in your defenses and smash the enemy to pieces as he attacks you rather than move out of those defenses and be the people who are doing the dying. When World War II comes, though, warfare has moved on. German generals know they cannot command the battlefield by a direct attack on the Maginot Line, but exploit the drawbacks of these static defenses. And it's hardly surprising that when they launched their major attack against France in 1940, that they would not do so in northeastern France, which was very well defended, but rather through Belgium, which was a lot more weakly defended. The Maginot Line did its job. The Germans did not attack it in 1940. They went around it because they respected the power of the Maginot Line. Speed and mobility are the keys to their success, making the Maginot Line obsolete. Blitzkrieg, rapid armored thrusts, combined with the devastating impact the warplane now brings to battle enables a German advance through Belgium, exposing a vulnerable section of the French frontier. Despite this experience, the Germans fall victim to the same limitations of static defense with their Atlantic war. 
Huge concrete defenses had been built along the coast of Western Europe. But on D-Day in 1944, the Allies overcome them. When you try to rely upon static defenses to defend great long frontiers, really, you're never going to achieve the, the densities of strength that you need to stop an enemy anywhere. The enemy's always got the initiative. He can decide where to attack, in what strength to attack, to what purpose to attack. Since World War II, success in warfare has increasingly depended on mobility, a commander's capacity to rapidly adapt and sometimes change the battlefield environment. And so, in the global conflicts of the 21st century, the skills of the military engineer are more important than ever. Generals needing command and control rely on them to help gain offensive or defensive advantage. Here, British engineers erect temporary fortifications at Bagram Air Base, Afghanistan, preparing the ground for the arrival of new troops. And just as Roman legionaries shaped the landscape at Masada 2,000 years ago, so today, modern soldiers still use the pick and shovel to mold the terrain as they engineer the ground for war. <laughs> 